So we'll talk about these now in, in greater detail. And our, our topologies, we can assign, when we create a feature, or we create a geodatabase topology, we can assign one or more feature classes to that topology. The key here is that a topology has to be created inside of our feature data set. That ensures that every feature class that participates in that topology has the common spatial reference because we're doing a spatial analysis of our data to make sure it meets our rules. So we'll assign those rules like the ones we were just talking about. And when we do that, we validate the data against the rules and it allows us to quickly locate errors. So we know where our data is not you know, perfect, where it's violating the rules. It doesn't matter. We can still use it. We can still print maps. We can still do analysis. But we have the advantage now of knowing how clean the data is. And we can use that as a guide uh, when we're planning and doing our analysis. And of course, we want to be able to fix those. And we are tools uh, that allow us to quickly locate those errors and fix them. But it's not required. We can still use the data even though uh, there are errors in it. And our topology includes not only the feature classes that take part in it, the rules we're going to assign. We can actually rank feature classes so that if we know one feature class is more accurate than another, that um, when we do the validate, we control how much shifting and moving uh, may go on with that through the use of a cluster tolerance. So those are the different parts of the topology. Now we're going to start talking about some of the, the attribute validation subtypes. So the, what we use a subtype for is to create uh, subgroups within a single feature class. And we do that because maybe the default values, attribute values for different types of data within the feature class may be different. So I, I've got a feature class that's called streets. And I want to break it down to is it a city street, is it a county street, is it a state highway, or is it a, a federally maintained highway? And I want to do that, one, because each one of these is owned and maintained by a different group, be it the city, the county, the state, or the feds, but also because I may have different default values. So maybe I know all my city streets are primarily paved with asphalt. So I can assign that as a default value to the city feature, uh, feature class in the city subtype. Or the county roads. Maybe the county roads, uh, I live in a rural county, and most of the county roads are still gravel or dirt. So I can assign that as the default pavement value. Whereas the state, most of those are similar to the city and their asphalt. Maybe the federals are paved in concrete. So I can subgroup these or subclassify these into these subtypes and assign different default values for my attribute fields. I can also, with my topologies, assign different topology rules based on subtype. So I mentioned one of the rules was that roads must not or may not intersect, which means when they come to a crossing, they must be broken. Well, that's true for, for most city and county roads, but in a lot of the cases with state and federal roads, we have over and underpasses, uh, in which case those roads could intersect, meaning one could pass over the other without having to be broken. So we might not want to apply that rule to the state and federal type roads, but we would to the city and county. And using subtypes allows me to do that. So I can assign the roads must not intersect to the city subtype and the county subtype, but would not uh, put that rule to the state and the federal subtypes. So it uh, increases the flexibility of our topology and the rules that it applies by combining it with subtypes. Domains consist of two types. There's a coded values domains and a range domains. This, this helps us to ensure that the attribute values to get plugged in to our attributes are, are clean and good. Okay. So the coded values is literally a list so that when we go to edit a field that has a list or a coded values domain assigned to it, we get a drop down. And only the values listed in that list can be selected. This helps reduce typos, helps keep our data normalized so when we do queries, we're not having to guess and figure out how many different ways somebody 
may have spelled bird or cat or dog or reptile as the example here shows. Our range domain is a list, uh, or, or not really a list, it's a accepted range of values. This is used with numbers. Okay, coded values can work with numbers, it can work with text. Range domains only work with number fields. So your integers, your uh, float, your double precision field types. Okay? And so it says that the number I put in there has to be between this number and that number. Okay? So maybe I have a range domain that says it's got to go from 100 to 500, as shown in the example. But I'm putting in uh, data on the substation, and for facility code, I put in a 50 instead of a 500. Well, then I can validate that and find out where my attribute value has va uh, violated my domain. And then, of course, go to fix it. Other advantages of the GEO database are security. Because one, everything's stored in, in a single location, it becomes much easier to manage. I know where it's at, and through a combination of uh, Windows or network security, as well as potentially the database itself, if it's an enterprise uh, GEO database, I can use the security features of the RDBMS that's powering it to control access. So that means it's much more secure. It's, it's a lot better than, say, shapefiles or coverage, which really doesn't have uh, any security other than what you can apply through your, your Windows or your network security. It's scalable, so we can start at that personal single-user geodatabase and expand up, go to a file geodatabase, or maybe we can use the personal geodatabase um, and go up to the enterprise level. And at the enterprise level, we can have you know the various. We have a personal SDE and an enterprise SDE, and work those together. So it becomes a very scalable format. So we can start with single users up through tens to hundreds and even thousands of users. The geodatabase can allow for multi-user editing. So if I've got three or four different people that need to edit data, I can do that with a personal, or I'm sorry, with a, a geodatabase. I can't do that with shapefiles. I can't do that with coverages. Those are only single editors. So it makes it much more efficient by allowing more than one person to keep and maintain my data. I can create versions. Uh, which are basically copies of my data. When I start dealing with the SDE level geodatabases, I can generate those versions so that, say, cop the, the, the planning department can have a copy of the data and they can work and maintain it. The tax assessors can have their copy. Public Works can have their copy. And all of them make their changes in there uh, at the, the layers that they have their security settings for. And then that gets migrated and pushed up back to the default enterprise version, and then we push that back down. So all the changes are, are happening. It also allows us to create what-if scenarios. So if I've got a planning department that's looking at various land use plans, and they want to say, well, what happens if I do this versus I happen to do that? I can create different versions that will allow us to run through those what-if scenarios without affecting the primary data sets. So it gives us that flexibility. And then we mentioned the ability to replicate data, the ability to push data from one or more data, geodatabases together so that we can really spread out the use of this through, through various data models. Now, there are some gotchas you need to make sure you're paying attention to. Uh, one of those is that not all licensing levels of desktop can edit all versions of a geodatabase. So if you're running ArtView or what will be called uh, ArcGIS Desktop Basic, you can't edit feature link annotation. That's because it's got a relationship class associated with it. You can't edit any feature class that takes part in a topology or a geometric network. And you can't edit any data that's stored in an SDE geodatabase. So basically, if you're using ArcGIS Server for your geodatabase, ArcView or ArcGIS Desktop Basic cannot edit that data. It can access it. You can view it with ArcView. You can query it. You can do simple analysis with it. You can generate maps with ArcView, pulling data from an SDE geodatabase, but you cannot edit it. Uh, other things, you can't make changes to the schema while 
the data is in use. So you got to be very careful on if you want to add a new feature class or you want to add a new attribute uh, field or things like that. You, there, there's limits to what kind of structural changes you make to your geodata, geodatabase while others are using it. Okay. Another thing to be careful about uh, if you use topologies, be careful about validating inside of Arc Catalog because you can validate the topology that is comparing your data against the rules and it will automatically begin fixing some of those using the the cluster tolerance snapping things together when you're on the validation well in our catalog there is no undo because you're not in an edit session you have to be in an edit session for you to be able to undo so be careful if you validate a topology inside of our catalog make sure that you have a cluster tolerance that's set low enough that you're not shifting data you don't mean to be shifted. My recommendation is do it in Arc Map in an edit session. That way you can undo it. You see the validation does something it's not supposed to. You can always stop it and go back. Okay. Uh, of course, in all cases, you should make sure you have a backup of your data. So. Hopefully you've enjoyed and learned some things from this presentation. If you need any uh, help or have any further questions, here is my contact information. I'll be happy to answer those for you. So have a good day and goodbye.